thank you for attending. We're just going to wait a couple more minutes to see, uh, let to let some other uh, people join. Thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Carol Matum and I work with Action on Smoking and Health, specifically on their California project, Advancing Momentum for a Tobacco-Free California. Thank you all for joining us today. We have an, a very exciting uh, presentation for you. Dr. Wendy Max is a professor, professor of health economics and director of the Institute for Health and Aging at UCSF. During this webinar, she will discuss the methods of estimating cost of tobacco use, including healthcare expenditures and the value of time lost due to illness and premature mortality. I know that this information will be very important to all of us, in particular, uh, those working with politicians and trying to get this message across to them around the cost of smoking. So with that being said, I'll turn it over to Dr. Max and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Carol. And I'm delighted to see how many people there are here. Let me see if I can successfully share my screen. Oh, it does this to me all the time. Give me one, uh, one second. I need to open. Okay. Okay. Well, what I'm going to talk about today is the economic impact of tobacco use. And what I wanna do is to give you sort of an overview of how we um, determine the economic impact of tobacco and then give you lots of examples. I've been doing this work for, I think it's closer to 35 years now. And I've done a lot of work in California. So I'm not gonna talk about every single thing that I've ever done, but I wanna give you some you know, enough examples so that you can maybe start thinking about how this might apply to your own work. So here's, here's the roadmap. I mean, first, you know, what I call Tobacconomics 101, sort of how you estimate the cost of tobacco use. Then to talk about a number of different pieces we've worked on. And as I said, how this might be relevant to your, your work. And I'll use the example of um, work we did well, we have ongoing work around Proposition 56, but we did some work sort of to help it get passed in the first place. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of that work. So let's start with the economics lesson before we get into the more applied work. When we talk about the cost of tobacco use, there are usually three, there, there, there are, I should say at least three components that, that are important. The first is, of course, health healthcare expenditures, the actual dollars that are that are spent um, relate, related to tobacco illness. And this might include um, expenditures for hospital care, sort of ambulatory outpatient care, prescription medications, home health, nursing home services, and, and other types of care that um, people who use tobacco end up requiring. We also talk about time lost from illness. I used to call this morbidity costs, but I've learned that you know, morbidity means something else to clinicians. It just means illness more generally. So I'm, I'm really talking about you know, the, the, the time lost from activities that you can't engage in because of illness related to tobacco use. And this comes in, you know, there's a diff couple different categories here. It might be days that you can't go to work, which, you know, are described as absenteeism. And that could also apply to um, people who are in school, kids or young adults or anyone who's in school actually, and is unable to attend um, school because of um, tobacco related issues. So that's absenteeism. There's a new term that you may have heard 
which is described as presenteeism. And that refers to people who show up, but they're not functioning at their full capacity. So workers who are not very productive because they're spending a lot of time taking tobacco breaks or because they're just not feeling well, or kids who aren't paying attention at school because they're thinking about their next vape. So that's referred to as presenteeism. And we also take into account the fact that people, you know, engage in activities at home as well, you know, household production, cooking, cleaning, maintaining the household, yard work. And these activities may also be impacted by um, tobacco related illnesses. And then finally, we know that people, you know, die prematurely. Um, there is a mortality cost associated with with tobacco use. And you know, here what we look at is the number of, of deaths and we also add up the life years lost. So people, you know, if, if a woman dies at the age of 65, but her life expectancy was 90, then she's losing 25 years of life. So we also, you know, add up the life years lost. And we attempt to value these years by looking at what they would have earned in the marketplace if they were so engaged and the value of that, that unpaid household, household production. And so here we include, you know, primarily it's, it's adults, it's 35 and over who are likely to die of tobacco related illness because there is a cumulative impact. But we know that there are also infants who are exposed in utero who also uh, suffer from, from tobacco exposure. So let me, say a little bit more about how we would estimate these, these costs. I'm talking now about healthcare expenditures and I wanna use smoking, cigarette smoking as the example. You know, my, my colleagues and I have spent the last 35 years studying costs of smoking. More recently, we're looking at a lot of other products, but let me, you know, I think the work on um, smoking, the models that we use here are the most developed. So here's kind of a conceptual framework. We look at smoking and how it leads to smoking related diseases, which result in individuals being in poor health and people who are in poor health may require um, healthcare expenditures. So that's kind of the main pathway. In our more recent work, we have recognized the importance of not just looking at smoking. Smoking behavior has changed over the years. Now, a, a majority of smokers are actually light smokers. They smoke fewer than 10 cigarettes per day. So we've adapted our models over time, and now we look separately at uh, light, moderate, and heavy smoking. And I also want to point out that um, there's this kind of direct pathway, but sometimes smoking leads to poor health without actually resulting in smoking-related diseases. So for example, if a distracted smoker um, breaks their leg, um, you know, that's really as a result of their smoking. Maybe they trip because they're not watching where they're going or something. Um, but in fact, they, they are in poor health and, and it's related to their smoking and their costs are likely to be higher because they're a smoker than if, if a non-smoker were to break their leg. And similarly, it's even possible for smoking to result in healthcare expenditures without even resulting in poor health. And an example there would be a, a pregnant smoker who may be more likely to have a low birth weight infant, which is going to be costly, but pregnancy is not you know, considered a, a health diagnosis. It's not, a poor, it's not poor health. So you know, our models allow for the different ways that smoking may ultimately lead to healthcare expenditures, whether it's through uh, smoking related diseases or more sort of in, indirectly. The way we estimate these healthcare expenditures is using what, what we describe as an excess cost approach. So what we're, what we're basically trying to do is to compare the healthcare expenditures of smokers or sometimes former smokers and never smokers. And to make those two groups of people the same in every way that we can, except for their smoking behavior. 
So, you know, maybe we, we find two groups and we match them and they, they're the same income level and the same age and gender, but, but the one difference is that they smoke. Or we can do this statistically. We can control for all of the ways in which smokers differ from non-smokers other than smoking. And so if these two groups of people are the same, then the difference in their healthcare utilization um, can be attributed to smoking because we've already controlled for, for everything else. So, you know, as an example, we might look at the hospital cost of a smoker, compare those with the hospital cost of someone who never smoked, but is the same in every way as the smoker. And then the difference is, is what we attribute to smoking because we've already uh, taken account of every other way in which, in which they differ. So that's kind of conceptually what we're, what we're trying to do here. I mentioned the value of lost productivity and we use kind of an excess cost approach as well. We look at um, the days lost from um, activity. Sometimes they're reported directly. Uh, sometimes we just compare two groups of people and who loses more time from school or from work. And again, if we can control for everything else, then, then what's left we can attribute to to smoking or, or to tobacco use more, more broadly. Our estimation of mortality costs is based on sort of a long, um, there's a long history of epidemiologic research figuring out attributable risks. So you can figure out how much of, of lung cancer deaths can be attributable to tobacco use. And in, for the case of lung cancer, it's, it's fairly high for the case of something like heart disease, it's not as large, but it's, but it's also kind of based on these large studies where we're comparing people over time and looking at all their risk factors and then trying to figure out, well, after we control for the other risk factors, what's left? Um, smoking is one of the things that's left. And so we figure out, and, and we, you know, the epidemiologists have developed relatively simple formulas if you have the data that you need and we figure out the deaths that can be attributed to smoking. And then we value those lives based on, um, well, there's a number of different ways to do this, but in our work, we've, we've used the approach where you look at, um, it's called the human capital approach, what someone would have produced in the workplace, what they, the value of what they would have produced at home. So that it sort of a, gives low estimates of the value of, of life, but that's, that's how we do it once we determine what deaths we can attribute to, um, to smoking or other types of tobacco use. So that, that's kind of a very, very quick overview of what, what we're doing from an economic perspective. The work that my colleagues and I do um, is based on analysis of large survey data sets. You know, the federal government conducts the National Health Interview Survey, a number of other surveys every every year, every couple of years, and we get data on hundreds of thousands of people. The state of California has some really excellent data sets, such as the uh, California Health Interview Survey, which is modeled on the, um, the National Health Interview Survey. So we have very good data for, um, for California, and there are other, there are other data sets as, as well. Okay, so now with that, let me show you how this work has, has been used, what, what we do with this, this approach. And I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about um, our work looking at the cost of, and we've looked at smoking so far, we haven't, we haven't looked at other types of tobacco use in, in the work I'm gonna talk about, but we've estimated the cost of smoking for each of California's 58 counties. And I think, you know, this, this can be useful for, for policymaking purposes because it's a fairly fine um, geo-local, you know, differentiation. Each of the 58 counties has its, has its own estimates. You know, maybe some of you have seen, seen these reports. Um, we've produced three reports at 10 year intervals. So the first one we did for 1989, then we did it in 1999. And we did it again for 2009. And I know what you're thinking, isn't 2019, didn't that just pass? We're, we're talking about doing it again. Um, we haven't started that yet. And it takes a couple of years to, 
to do these estimates. And of course, you have to wait a few years so you can get the data for 2019, though I think that those data are now available. But we produced three different reports. They look very similar, but they're actually based on very different methods because, you know, the, the, the data have gotten better over time, our understanding of how to work with the data, the methodology has improved. So each time we've used the, you know, the most current models that were the most current methodologies that, that were available to us. So we came up with estimates for each of the 58 counties in the state. And we can do this by, you know, we look separately at adults and adolescents. We look at different genders. We look at current, former, and never smokers, light, moderate, heavy smokers, as I mentioned. And this information co does come from the, um, the California Health Interview Survey. The report, I'm gonna walk you through what the report looks like just because it might be of use to you. <coughs> the report has three different sets of tables. First, we have some tables that, that are state level estimates. For example, <coughs> uh, this is a table showing total deaths and deaths attributable to smoking in California. And these are some of the um, parameters that it's difficult to do at the county level. And in fact, you know, we may not want to do them at the county level because when you when you work with large data, you have to be very careful not to identify anybody. And I mean, even at the this is for all women in the state. <coughs> if you look at this, you see that once you start looking at smoking attributable deaths for um, respiratory tuberculosis, there's only five female deaths in the whole state. So if we did that at the county level, you might be able to figure out who it was. So we, we do these at the state level. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, then we have some tables where we present all 58 counties together in the same table. So for instance, here's the summary cost table showing the total cost, the direct healthcare costs, and then the two um, lost productivity measures from illness and from premature death. But in one table, we list all 58 counties. And that can be useful because you can see how the counties compare. I mean, of course, as you probably expect, um, the costs are greatest in Los Angeles County. Los Angeles is the largest, most populous county in the state. You know, you, you'd probably be re more reasonable to look at the cost per smoker or the cost per person, which we also include. But you know, this just gives you a sense of how how much variation there is, even within the state, um, when you look from county to county. And then what we did was we took all the information for each county and put it together in one place in our two-page county profile. Um, this one is for Los Angeles. So in one table, you see all the results that are in the rest of the report. So you see the total cost. And here we do calculate it both per resident and per smoker. So, you know, one of the things I want to just mention as I go through this is ways to present the information that, that can be useful for different purposes. So we presented it both per resident and per smoker. Uh, we broke it down for, for uh, males, females, and by, you know, whether it was the direct healthcare costs or the lost productivity measures. We also broke the healthcare costs down by type of healthcare cost because I think sometimes that's really useful to see whether it's hospital costs or outpatient costs. We have the population estimates that were used to develop these per, per person estimates, smoking prevalence, um, Let's see, see, this is where my screen is, is partly covered. This is um, deaths, years of potential life lost and lost productivity. So this is, this is what the, the report looks like. Some of the highlights of this report, you know, we have our total cost estimates. We updated these to 2014, but we haven't, you know, we're gonna do new estimates rather than keep updating it. So it was about $20 billion was the cost of smoking in California for 2014. And you can see how it breaks down. About half of that is for healthcare costs. Um, the lost productivity from premature mortality was quite high and then the rest was the lost productivity from illness. 
Um, at the state level, it's almost $500 for each resident of the whole state. And then it's 4,600 for each smoker. And again, there's quite a bit of variation from, uh, from county to county. Another way that we thought was useful to present this information is to look at the cost per pack of cigarettes. Um, you know, that, that's another way. If you're, if you're involved in a program where you're reducing the number of packs of cigarettes sold, you can see what it's gonna save. And again, about half of that is healthcare costs. It's almost $9 per pack of cigarettes and the productivity losses make up the rest of that um, $17.50 per, per each pack of cigarettes sold. We also looked at how this cost of smoking compares to the revenues we get from cigarettes. You know, you sometimes hear it said that, well, you know, we, we, make, we make people pay taxes when they buy each pack of cigarettes. Is that covering the cost of, um, of the health effects of smoking? No, um, when we did this study um, at that time, the cost of smoking was $21 for every dollar of cigarette tax revenue generated. And keep in mind that that was before um, Proposition 56 increased the tax per pack by, it was almost tripled it. So if it tripled it, then instead of, so now maybe it's only $7 per pack. But, you know, certainly this kind of information is helpful in convincing people that, you know, we can increase the tax per pack of cigarettes. Look at what the cost is. Um, it, it's many, many times the tax revenue generated, and there's still room to use that justification anyway to increase the, the cost, the, to increase the tax per pack of cigarettes. Though I don't think we'll do it for a while, having just implemented a very large um, increase with, with Prop 56. We looked at how many years of potential life lost are due to smoking, and it was over half, half a million bit more for males than for females, but for every individual who died prematurely from smoking, um, and this, when I say prematurely, I mean, we're comparing their age of death with what their life expectancy would have been. 17 years of life are lost. So that's, that's another way of kind of thinking about the economic um, impact of, of smoking here. Because we've done these studies now, because I've done three of them at 10 year intervals, an obvious question that, that I would get asked is, well, how does this compare with what happened you know, 10 years earlier? Once you have a track record, you have to start being accountable for that. And so we did look at how the costs we estimated compared to the costs from the previous report. And what we found was, you know, the good news was the number of smoking attributable deaths had decreased. It had gone down by you know, 20%. Um, which, is, which is good news. The nominal cost of smoking had increased by 15%. That just means the, act, the, the dollars that we estimated, but of course, those are also impacted by inflation. So after we did that adjustment, the, um, the real cost of smoking was shown to decrease by, by 22%. So, you know, that is certainly, that is certainly good news, but the costs are still very high, which is why all of us are here today. While we, you know, I, I argue that this keeps people like me um, in, in business. And I will also add, and I don't think I need to say this to this particular group, but, you know, we were just looking at smoking. When we did the first report um, in 1989, smoking was the main thing. Of course, the tobacco landscape has changed considerably. And many people are smoking less, but now they're vaping. So, you know, we have to take that into account. And I, um, if we do another um, cost of smoking report, we will, we will have to take into account other tobacco products. I don't know how much detail we'll be able to do that in, but we, you know, that's the elephant in the room. We have to acknowledge that. So just to summarize, um, what we found in these reports where we where we've looked at the cost of smoking across the whole state is that many Californians still smoke and smoking attributable costs are high. They're falling, but they're still very high. There's a wide range among the different counties. Uh, the tax revenues, even with the increase, still don't come close to covering the cost of smoking. And I think, you know, the good news is that, that, that the California tobacco control programs are having a great impact but there's still work to be done. 
And by the way, I put the link to our the most recent report here. Um, I think these slides are going to be available to you afterwards. So if anybody wants to look at the report, it's online. You can look up your county or whatever information would would be useful to you. And I want to just spend another minute talking about the different ways to present these kinds of findings. I mean, there are, you know, there's many ways as there are people who want to present them, but let me just show you a couple of examples. I mean, here's kind of what we academicians do in a journal article. We would, you know, it's dry, just the facts. Among 15% of all, almost 15% of all deaths were due to smoking, et cetera, et cetera. That's one way to present the information. And even if you don't want to present it that way, it's important that it get into the academic, um, the peer reviewed literature because it gives it credibility. It means that it was reviewed by experts in the field who decided that this was a legitimate study to, to publish. But there are other ways that might be more effective to get, the, um, to get these results across to different audiences. Um, here is a uh, infographic that was done after we did this last report. And you see here, you know, looking at the lives that, um, that, could, that have been saved by the California Tobacco Control Program. Show it, you know, in pictures. Look, looks like a lot of bodies there, or a lot of um, a lot of dollars. I like the skeleton here, smoking the cigarette. Um, and so this this was, I think, this came out just before um, Prop Fifty Six was on the ballot. So this was one way of just sort of conveying this information that um, smoking is is costly, and we need to we need to figure out ways to reduce it. And here's, here's one of my favorite posters. After we did the first report in the early 1990s, I was at a some kind of a tobacco control conference and I gave a talk and after the talk, a woman came up to me and she said, well, I should show you what we did with your, your data in San Luis Obispo County. Maybe some of you here are from San Luis Obispo County, maybe even this person whose name I don't think I ever got. Um, <laughs> but she mailed me this poster. And I love it. You know, it's a newspaper headline, smoking costs San Luis Obispo County millions. And these are all data. These are all numbers that, that were in the first report that we did, but presented in just a much more visual, um, visceral um, way. You know, my, my personal favorite is the death factoid showing, you know, all the deaths and how they break down. But you know, I think this was just really effective. And this, this is information that was meaningful to San Luis Obispo County. We can talk about a huge 42,000 deaths in the state, but you know, how many of them were in San Luis Obispo County? Maybe that hits a lot closer to, to home. What I don't know is what they did with these posters. I don't know if they put them around in store windows or just whatever, but I, I just, I love this poster. You can tell from the picture that I took of it recently that it's getting kind of tattered because I, you know, I carry it around with me whenever I give a, a talk on this topic. I love to show this this poster because, you know, to be honest, you don't always know how your work is being used. You put it out there, and I was just so pleased that this person came up and shared this um, shared this with me, so I could I could see how it was used, and I thought they did a, a fantastic job. So this is, you know, this is this report that, you know, takes us like two years to produce it because there's a lot of data analysis and a lot of keeping track of numbers that counties have to add up to the total, et cetera, et cetera. But have, having done this work for the state, we've extended the work using similar modeling approaches to look at a number of subcommunities, a number of underrepresented communities in, um, in California. The first study that we did looked at um, African-Americans and Hispanic communities in California. So the results that we found for the African-American community made sense. You know, African-Americans African -Americans bear a disproportionate share of the cost of smoking in California. Um, the smoking prevalence was the highest, I think at the time it was 19%. Um, it was the highest cost of smoking per smoker, it was over seven thousand dollars per per smoker and if you look at sort of how it breaks down there six percent of california's adult population is african-american but yet they um they bore ten percent of the cost of smoking eight percent of the healthcare expenditures and fully thirteen percent 
of mortality costs. So there was, you know, this is clearly a disproportionate share of the, the burden of, of smoking. But when we looked at the Hispanic community, it was a little less obvious how to interpret the results. And I remember I had to kind of sit with this for a while because you, know, you want to be careful what message you send out. In fact, you know, the, the Hispanic community has the, I think it's the second lowest um, cost of smoking after um, Asian Americans. It was 13, just over 13%. Um, when we did the study. However, there, there are a very large number of smokers. A large proportion of California residents are of Hispanic background. And so we're talking about um, almost a million smokers. And, and the cost per death of the mortality cost, the years of potential life lost were very high per, um, per life lost. And so, you know, it finally kind of became clear to me that I think what this is telling us is that there's a huge potential um, for a, an epidemic, you know, in, in the Hispanic community. And so our goal should be to keep the smoking rates as low as they are now. And we already were seeing evidence of the tobacco industry targeting of Hispanic smokers. So, you know, this is sort of good news and bad news. There, the prevalence is relatively low, but you know, you take a low rate and apply it to a high number, you still get a lot of um, a lot of smokers. So it was, you know, the 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 way we interpreted our findings for these two communities was different, but but important in both in both cases. And one of the things we did here was we prepared fact sheets, one for the African American community, one for the Hispanic community, with just kind of summaries of key results from our, um, from our study with, with references. Um, and we distributed these, you know, I, now it's so easy to distribute things like this. You just get an electronic version of it and you send it to your listserv, you hit send and it goes out to hundreds of people. I think there were times when these were printed out and handed out at conferences, but you know, it doesn't, and we would always put in our budget, you know, we're gonna print a thousand copies of this, but you don't need to do that anymore. People don't want paper. <clears throat> they'd much rather get it in an email. So it's very easy to, to share information like this once, um, once it's developed. So I just wanted to mention one other group that we applied our smoking costs models to, and that was to the California uh, les lesbian, uh, gay and bisexual community. And I'm not gonna go through all of the findings of, of that report, but. I just want to show you one, one thing that we did here. The reason I did this study was because a colleague of mine came up to me, I don't know, probably five years or maybe even 10 years before we did the study. And he said, and this, this is a colleague who is a longtime activist in the um, LGBT tobacco control community. I think he was one of the founders of CLASH, the Coalition of Lavender Americans um, on Smoking and Health. And he said to me, you know, I think tobacco is killing more gay men than HIV and somebody ought to look into this. And I have a few colleagues and when they say something like that, they kind of look at me like somebody ought to look into it and you're the person. So, you know, every time I would see my, my dear friend Nat Natali often when I would see him, um, I would say, you gotta do that study. We really need to get that study going. But, you know, we never could quite find the right funding mechanism until a couple of years later, um, TRDRP, the Tobacco Related Disease Research Program, put out their call for research studies. And one of the priority populations they identified was the LGBT community. So I said, NAF, I think this is our moment. So we, we did this study. And you know, as I said, we, we estimated costs for, um, for men and women in the community, but we also did address the question that he had initially posed to me which was to compare deaths from um, HIV AIDS and deaths from tobacco in, the, um, in this community. Um, I think we just looked at gay men, gay and bisexual men. Um, and here you see what, what we found. The blue line is deaths from um, HIV AIDS, which were very, very high back you know, in the early 2000s and have been falling dramatically because of treatments, because of prevention, because of changes in behaviors because of all sorts of things. So, you know, the, the rates are coming down. Um, the 
deaths from smoking have also been falling, but much less dramatically. But um, what that means is that eventually, and it looked from, from our data, we predicted it would be around the year 2000, I think, that deaths from tobacco would, would claim, to, tobacco would claim more lives among the gay bisexual community in California than HIV. And so, you know, again, this was sort of a, an interesting way to present it. One of the reasons that we were so interested in doing this is because the LGBT community was so effective at rallying against, you know, AIDS when it first when it first came out. I mean, they're they're the role model for how a group can become politically active and implement real change, get funding for research and and so forth. And um, they hadn't yet embraced tobacco in the same way. So this was something we would hope, you know, to get the attention of these these well you know, experienced activists to, to turn their attention to, to another cause, which is indeed having a very negative impact on their community. So this, this was what we, what we did. Um, so another thing that we looked at, um, we've looked at over the years, after we spent a lot of time looking at active smoking, we, we turned our attention to secondhand smoke exposure. And we came up with estimates for healthcare and other productivity losses for people exposed to secondhand smoke. We've looked at adults, we've looked at kids, and I don't want to go into all of, all of the different work. We, those estimates are out there and they're published. But I want to mention sort of a different twist that we, we took on this. And this was at the suggestion of Stan Glantz, who many of you must, must know or at least know of. Um, we, one of the things we had looked at was the relationship between secondhand smoke exposure and um, ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder among kids. And we came up with a way of determining how many um, cases of ADHD could be attributed to secondhand smoke exposure using models where, you know, you compare kids who are exposed with kids who aren't and control for everything else. And we, we came up with an estimate of about $644 million for um, healthcare costs attributable to um, ADHD resulting from secondhand smoke exposure. And Stan's question was, well, what that sounds like, you know, what, what does it cost the school districts? What does it cost the education system? So we looked at these, you know, we had an estimate of the number of cases of ADHD that we could attribute to secondhand smoke exposure. And we found a published study, we didn't do that work ourselves, looking at you know, the resources that school, school districts devote to kids with ADHD to meet their educational needs. And when we added that up, it, it came to $2.9 billion. So in fact, you know, the cost to the education system were four and a half times the cost of the healthcare system when you look at um, ADHD that is associated with secondhand uh, smoke exposure. So, you know, I think the, the, the use of this kind of information is that, you know, this is a good way to sort of rally educators who should also be very strong allies for reducing secondhand smoke exposure um, for financial reasons, because it's costing the school districts a lot, of, a lot of money. I know that, you know, educators are strong partners in many other areas of tobacco control, but, you know, secondhand smoke exposure should should be on the list. So I, I mentioned this because this is another way that we kind of used our economic studies to, um, to, to try to have an impact on what's, what's going on in the, in the community and in the state. Okay, so let me, let me turn my attention to, to shift gears a, a little bit. You know, I've been talking about um, smoking and cigarettes, but you know, my colleagues and I have spent time looking at many other tobacco products. We've looked at cigars and smokeless tobacco. Those 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 papers have been published. Now we're we're wrapping up some work that we've done on electronic cigarettes, which of course is what everybody is you know very interested in these days. So I'll just show you what what we found in in this area. Um, and you know what what's changed now. Our our work keeps evolving over time. It was easy when all we had to look at were, were cigarettes. You can't just look at cigarettes anymore because people use cigarettes and then they also, 
not many people just use one tobacco product. When we looked at electronic cigarettes, we found that if you looked at everybody who used electronic cigarettes, 95% um, of them also use other tobacco products. The most common combination is cigarettes and electronic cigarettes. But a lot of people also use those two products and other tobacco products or electronic cigarettes and cigars or any other product. So we developed these models and it, you know, took us quite a bit of time, but here's, here's the bottom line. If we looked at the healthcare expenditures attributable to e-cigarette use for people who use um, e-cigarettes, regardless of what else they use, we come up with 15, over $15 billion in, in um, and this is actually a national estimate. This isn't just California, but much of that 13.8 billion is for people who use electronic cigarettes along with other products. But we were able to tease out the component that's attributable to only use of um, people who only use e-cigarettes. Um, and there are still people out there who are only using e-cigarettes. But even if we you know, only look at that small proportion of people who use e-cigarettes and nothing else, the cost is over a billion dollars a year, just the healthcare costs. So um, you know, we're spending more and more of our time looking at other products. And in fact, we're, we're very interested in this use of dual or poly tobacco use because it's the rule now. Um, it's, it's the way people, it's the way tobacco use behaviors have, have changed. Okay, so let me talk about one last area and then I hope, well, we should have some time left for, for your questions. I wanna give you um, an example of how this work has been used to develop, to analyze the impact of tobacco control policies in California. And you know, my, my colleagues and I have done quite a bit of work in this area. Um, I personally was involved as an expert witness back in the 90s when the attorneys general of 42 states sued the tobacco industry for healthcare costs that they had to bear, the state had to bear because the industry had you know, their behavior had convinced people to keep smoking. So that was one application. And we used our models to estimate what the healthcare costs that the states had to bear and should be reimbursed for. Um, then oh, at one point we did a general evaluation of the California Tobacco Control Program. This was a very complex dynamic model that looked out a hundred years, I think. And we had very hard to get data to do those kinds of analyses, but we did um, we did that and found that the tobacco control program is saving us lots of money. Um, I'm just finishing up now some work that I have been doing looking at Tobacco 21, which was implemented in California in um, 20, 2016, but and now as of 2019 is, is national. Um, but we've done some work looking at how um, how it's impacting retailers, for example, how it's impacting healthcare costs, how it's impacting you know, adolescent youth of use of tobacco products. And then another evaluation we did was the Mix project. It was the Medi-Cal incentives to quit smoking. The um, federal centers, CMS, Centers for Medicare, Medicare and Medicaid Services um, made grants available to the state and California got, I think, $20 million or something to develop an intervention for Medi-Cal smokers. And so we came up with a, uh, my colleagues designed an intervention and my, my team and I did a cost effectiveness analysis of that um, inter intervention. So these are different things we've done, but what I wanna talk about today is some of the work we've done around tobacco taxation. Um, what happened was, we did a study um, maybe around 2015 when the first tax increase initiative was on the ballot. And if you remember, the first initiative was to increase the tax by a dollar per pack and it didn't pass. But we did a study looking at what would be the impact of a dollar per pack. And then when, when the second one finally made it onto the ballot, uh, it turned out we picked the wrong number. It was actually $2, so we redid our estimates. And we looked at what would be the impact of a $2 per pack um, increase in the excise tax, um, what would be the impact on smoking prevalence and on healthcare costs? And one of the things that's interesting about tobacco taxes is that they change smoking behavior or tobacco use behavior 
in a couple of different ways. I mean, one thing is that when you increase the tax, probably the companies are going to raise the prices. And when prices go up, people buy less. So if the, the tax by just increasing the price is going to cause people to use less tobacco. But they there's a question of what that money, the tax revenue is used for. And so in this case, you know, the tobacco tax revenue goes at least in part to tobacco control funding. So at the same time prices are going up, tobacco control programs are expanding. And so that also has a reinforcing impact. So we had to kind of consider both of these. So what we did was to look at what smoking prevalence would be with and without this $2 per pack increase um, in, in the tax. And we figured this out by comparing California with other states that were somewhat similar but didn't raise their taxes. Because we know that you know, there's a trend that we want to keep in the background. I'll, sh I'll show you the figure in just a second. And then we compared um, what healthcare expenditures would be under two scenarios. The first is the baseline case where we don't, where nothing changes. The tax remains at 87 cents per pack. And at that point, you know, with, when the tax was 87 cents per pack, tobacco control funding was getting about five cents per pack. And then we said, okay, but what if we increase it in 2017 by $2 per pack? And if we do that, we assumed that, you know, be, because some of those revenues are committed to other causes, for example, backfill commitments that have been made for previous um, policy changes, we assumed that 11% of revenues would go to tobacco control. So the tobacco control funding would more than, would more than double. And here's what we came up with. The green line shows you the baseline case. And, you know, as I said, we want to acknowledge that tobacco, um, that this is, this is just smoking. Um, smoking prevalence is going down over time. I mean, we have a very effective tobacco control program, even without, you know, this, despite the fact that the tax has not um, changed over, over time. Um, and then we looked at what would be the impact on smoking prevalence if we were to increase the tax by $2 per pack. And there's a pretty steep response in the beginning because these programs, when they're new, they're very effective. The price goes up, people immediately, you know, overnight the price goes up by $2 a pack or something. People change their behavior and over time it, it becomes somewhat less effective, but you end up on a, you know, a lower trajectory. So we projected that with this tobacco tax um, increase, smoking prevalence in 2020 would be about 7.1%. And I have to tell you that um, you know, I'm, I'm a member of the of TROC, the Tobacco Education Research and Oversight Committee. And the chair, who's a good friend of mine, Mike, Mike Ahn, would always say at these meetings, well, if Wendy's estimates are correct, you know, smoking prevalence should be this. And I always would like hold my breath and be afraid to look to see what the numbers really were. Um, the good news is that in See, I just looked this up the other in, in the tobacco facts and figures that CDPH puts out. They they estimated 6.9 percent smoking cigarette smoking prevalence in 2019. So um, actually, even a little better than than we predicted. So I I was like relieved. And so, given that we given these estimates of smoking prevalence, we then compared the healthcare costs at you know what is it seven seven percent. Um, 7% and 9% and figured out what the difference, the savings would be each year. Here's what we found. It was about a billion dollars a year. And the total savings over the first four years would be uh, four, um, over four, $4 billion. So, you know, our, our conclusion from all this was that our tobacco control program is very successful, but it becomes less successful over time if you don't raise taxes because inflation erodes the funding that's given to tobacco control activities. You don't change anything. It's as if you're getting less money. Um, so we need to be more aggressive to keep, um, to reduce smoking prevalence. And I mean, it's been shown for years and years that an increase in the tobacco taxes is a highly effective, maybe one of the most effective ways to reduce smoking. And it has this dual impact on um, funding tobacco control activities and also um, increasing tobacco um, prices. And we, we put out a, a fact sheet here. These are the two tables that I just showed you. And we distributed this, um, I think it was online, but it was shortly before the, before um, Prop 56 was on the initiative, 
was on the ballot because we wanted, you know, this was our, our scientific research. We wanted this information to be out there so that people could take it into account when they did their, um, when they decided how to vote. So let me just, you know, summarize what, what I've said in the last hour, you know, how can economic analyses be helpful in your work? Well, I think, you know, that, that coming up with costs related to smoking or tobacco use more broadly is one more dimension that you can use to measure the impact of your, your own program. Um, it's another metric, but it can be very important. And also it's, it can, costs can be compared across different kinds of programs. You know, a dollar is not particular to tobacco. You can use dollars to look at the impact of defense programs or education programs. So you can compare different kinds of interventions. And costs are a metric that legislators understand. It's sort of their lingua franca. So I think it's, it's useful to, I think a lot of, um, you know, politicians resonate with cost savings. They, they know what to do with that. But I do want to acknowledge that, you know, you have to remind yourself that there are some um, limitations here. So for instance, you can add up costs, but if you're trying to target a particular group, you want to do more than just add up costs. You want to see how your program is impacting the, the group that you're targeting in your, in your, um, in your program. And you, know, you may not get all aspects of your program because it's hard to figure out the, the economic impact, the cost of things like keeping kids in school. You know, if one thing we've learned, if there's one thing we've learned from the um, COVID pandemic, it's the importance of keeping kids in school, but it's hard to assign a dollar value to that. Or even just looking at benefits that may not occur till far down the road when you have to make your decisions today. But nonetheless, I, I hope that um, some of this information will spur you to think about how it might be useful to include an economic component in your analyses if you're not already doing it. I know some of you, some of you already are. So I thank you for, for listening and we have a little bit of time left for, for questions. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Wendy. Um, we do have a few questions in the chat and in our Q&A, a few people have their hands up. We'll try to get to as many of these as we can. But I know everybody has a burning question, which is, um, are you working on or are your coll colleagues working on uh, providing any more current data on these uh, really important topics? Yeah. Um, well, I would love to update the cost of smoking in California report. And I have actually been in conversation with our, my colleagues at TRDRP. In fact, they approached us. They're very interested in doing this. They've funded a lot of the, the previous reports. So I think we got some funding from CDPH and some from the CDC maybe. So we're, we're talking with them. I think the pandemic threw everybody off schedule, but I would like very much to do this and, and hope, hope to do so. Um, we have some ongoing studies that are looking at different, different pieces. Um, my, my colleague Kai Ed Sung is doing a lot of work on Prop 56, looking at the, the impact of the proposition. We're looking at you know, price elasticity of demand. We're also looking, starting to look at the relationship not only between um, tobacco, different types of tobacco use, but marijuana also figures into this. So we've, we've got a lot of different pieces that we're, we're looking at. So thank you for asking us that. <laughs> okay, our first question comes from um, actually a lawyer suing tobacco companies. And the question is, is the comparison of smokers, never smokers or past smokers more reliable for computing the aggregate tobacco damage than the system used in the state's lawsuits in the 90s of the, U, of the US uh, disease by disease? Um, well, I'm trying to think I was involved in that litigation and we were still, we were using these kinds of models. I mean, yes, we did some of it on a disease specific basis, but you still need to know, you still need to figure out attribution. So how much of a particular disease, um, how many cases or what proportion of that can be attributed to tobacco. And the, the standard is to compare, you know, we talk about the non-smoking smoker um, to compare that way. I mean, there are other ways that one could do it, but I think this is kind of the, the state of the art right now. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, can we quantify your model at a micro level to small towns and rural er areas? 
Is there an analytics calculator that we can use per county based on local new data? Um, well, you know, it's these kinds of statistical models require large sample sizes in order to use them. I've, I've often had people say, well, what about, you know, the city of um, Mountain View? You give me the estimate for Santa Clara County and we, it, we may not have a large enough sample to do some of that, but there are ways around that. So you take the cost per person in the county and apply it to the population of your local area. So there are ways to, to sort of work from the data that are available to smaller, smaller areas. Whatever we do, it's never current enough and it's never small enough. And I, I understand that, but I'm delighted that people still want the information, so. How do you determine if ADHD uh, is caused by secondhand smoke? Well, what we do, you know, I, I don't like to use the word cause, it's more sort of an associative relationship, but we look at, we compare kids who are exposed mm -hmm. to secondhand smoke with kids who aren't exposed to secondhand smoke, and we control for everything else that we can, other things that we know relate to ADHD, so that, you know, our statistical model is trying to eliminate all other causes, and what's left is, um, secondhand smoke exposure. And by the way, in that, in that work, we did not, we eliminated anyone exposed in utero. This was only kids who were being exposed as, as children after, after they're born. Um, could you comment on why your LGB data does not include non-binary non or trans folks? Yeah, because we don't have data on that. I mean, we, I, I mean, I know I keep wanting to say LGBT and it was really LGB that we looked at because the data came from the California Health Energy Survey, which I'm pleased to say added questions on um, sexual identity um, a few years ago, but they don't ask questions about, they, they have a write-in field and we looked at that and there just weren't enough people. Now, you know, that, that may have changed, but there, it was not possible for us to identify um, trans or other non-binary folks. So that it, it's data limitations, we, not because we didn't think it was important. Okay, thank you. What kind of sample sizes are needed to produce estimates on the cost of tobacco use for a particular population? That remains a difficulty of doing sub LGBT, yeah. LGBTQ analyses. Yeah, I don't know if I can give you a magic number, I would say, probably 50 or 100 people. I mean, more the more the better. I think the National Center for Health Statistics won't report any numbers that are based on cell sizes of under 30, but you need more than 30 to get that subpopulation because you're comparing groups. So you, you need, you know, it, it can't be a study of 10 people. You can't really come up with any reliable estimates from that. But if you have 50 or 100, you might be able to. Uh, do you have any data um, comparisons for cigar, little cigar, cigarillo use? Um, you know, the latter two yeah. are, are sold very cheaply and taxed differently. We did a study of the cost of cigar smoking, but unfortunately that was using the, um, the best data source we could find was the National Health Interview Survey. And they didn't ask for those distinctions. They only asked about cigars. And we thought, well, maybe if they tell us how often, you know, how many cigars people smoke per day, maybe we could figure out whether they were little cigars or traditional cigars or cigarillos. And they didn't ask that. So again, you know, as, as because these models are dependent on large data sets, we're at the mercy of the people that write the questions. And you know, soon there will be, I think there are now data sets that allow us to, to differentiate types of cigars, but there wasn't anything when we did that study. And some of those data sets may have details on cigars, but they don't have the information that we need to link to that, such as health conditions or healthcare utilization. So it's a data okay. limitation. Thank you. I think this will be our last question. Um, do you have any data for Indian tribes in California or are you aware of any of this type of information, for instance, provided by the Indian Health Service or otherwise? Yeah, it's not a group we have been able to look at. I believe there was a, wasn't there a, a specific survey? Sometimes there are surveys that are targeted for particular populations. And I thought there had been one for tribal communities, but it's quite old now. Um, and I'm not positive about that, but it, there hasn't been anything more, more recently, but that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, again, it's a data, 
limitation. Thank you, thank you. So for our participants, um, you'll be receiving an, receiving an email with our evaluation for this webinar. Uh, if you complete the survey, uh, the evaluation and provide your email address, you'll be entered into a drawing to receive one of two $50 gift certificates. So two participants will receive $50 gift certificates. Uh, we really enjoyed the webinar today and thank you all for participating. Uh, we hope to see you soon uh, in more ASH related webinars. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you for listening. <laughs>